All right. Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. As has already been said, it is good to see your lovely smiling faces this morning. Hey, there was a smile. Good to see you today after several weeks um, being quarantined, not having in-person church. It is good to see people today. I know several people couldn't get out because of the cold weather, but we're glad that you have made it. Someone's find my phone is gone. <laughs> Uh, so this week I've been thinking a lot about names. I mean, you can imagine why I was thinking about names. And I, I did a little research and I, I thought of the name Lance. Now, I grew up with somebody named Lance. It's not a real common name today. But, you know, yeah, well, it, it, Lance was a common name, especially if you go back to like the medieval days, um, Knights of the Round Table, um, King Arthur. Lan uh, not many people are named Lance today. But back then, <laughs> there was a lot of like, there was Lance, ah, come on, I got so many things going on. A lot of, many people, no, I had it all worked out and I only, all I wrote in my notes was Lance a lot. Shoot. <laughs> you, so, so, many people. The name was used Lance a lot. Many people were named Lance a lot. People were named, no, okay, well, let's start all over again. Do over. No, I did because I totally forgot my own punchline. But back in the medieval days, many people were named Lance a lot. People were named Lance a lot. Facebook Live, shut that down. Yeah, I know. You knew what I was trying to get to, but it's just um, butchered. Speaking of names, I also learned that Yoda from the Star Wars movies, you know Yoda? Yoda actually has a last name. Did you know that? Yoda's last name is Leahy Hu. And I did a little research. It comes from Swiss Alpine origins. So his full name is Yoda Leahy Hu. I know. And if I would have nailed the Lancelot one, it would have been so much better. I actually have a screenshot of the joke on my phone. I can't bring it up right now because I'm using it to stream. Um, grace and peace to you and to your pastor as well. <laughs> it has been a trying couple of weeks. But in all reality, we are talking about names today. Now, everybody here has a name. I know your name. You were given a name. You go by a name. If you have children, you named your children and gave them a name. But we also go through life and we, we kind of take on other names. Sometimes these names are given to us. They're nicknames. Sometimes we kind of give them to ourselves. And sometimes these kind of reflect who we want to be. And other times they reflect who others see us, how others see us. So maybe you would call yourself funny. Maybe not this morning. I wouldn't call myself funny. But maybe you call yourself funny or attractive or smart. Maybe you think of yourself as gifted and musical. Or maybe you think of yourself as the stupid, as slow, as ignorant. Maybe you think of yourself as ugly or broken. These are the names that we give ourselves and others give us. Well, today we're going to look at these different names that we have been given and these different names that we've taken upon ourselves. We want to see how God sees us. And we're going to explore this weird phrase, this Beulah land. It's probably something you've heard before, but I don't know that in my years of, of being a pastor, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon on Beulah land. I'm not sure that I've ever actually heard anybody define Beulah land, but that's all going to come to an end today. Okay? I can see the anticipation in your smiling faces. <laughs> So first of all, let's just talk a little bit about the context of the scripture that Sonia read for us here this morning. So Isaiah is just this really weird book. If you go through the book of Isaiah, you just start reading random places. Like you see Isaiah is all over the place. Like at some points he's extremely happy. He's extremely full of hope. And then you go a few chapters later and the guy's just like depressing. Like I don't know what to do with this. And the reason for that is that the book of Isaiah was written over a period of about 70 years. So 70 years. So we have different kind of things going on, different kind of context that Isaiah is experiencing. 
Now, scholars will break down Isaiah into three different groupings. They call them first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah. You are with me. First Isaiah is simply chapters 1 through 39. And this is the part that talks a lot about the fallenness of Israel, the mistakes that they have made. There's all these woes, Israel. You're about to go into exile, Israel. Second Isaiah 44 through 55 Well, these are full of hope and inspiration, words of comfort. This is where we get the the, um, prophecy about like John the Baptist. The high places will be made low, the low will be made high, and you will be able to return to the promised land. And we get to third Isaiah. Sometimes we call it tritero Isaiah, which is just fun to say. There's deutero Isaiah, tritero Isaiah. I don't know how you'd make it fancy with first. First tero Isaiah. (laughs) The third Isaiah is just this weird one. Like, it's full of these these promises and these visions, and it's kind of scary and depressing, but also enlightening at the same time. I'll give you some examples. So, first Isaiah, in chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. Remember, this is when they're being told that they're going to go into exile. Hear me, you heavens. Listen, earth. The Lord has spoken. I reared your children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manager, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Now, essentially, God's saying through, through through, through Isaiah, he's saying donkeys and oxen get it better than you do. (laughs) Not a real good compliment here. So this is before they go into exile. Seventy years pass. We come to Isaiah 40. It's the sweet words of Handel's Messiah. Comfort, comfort ye my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So the people are going back to Jerusalem. They're going back to the promised land. And then we jump ahead to the last couple of chapters in Isaiah and we find a totally different message. This is from the very last chapter of Isaiah, 66, verse 24. You know how some people have life verses? They're like, this is my life verse, this one speaks to me, this is gonna be my life verse. And they will go out and look upon the dead, dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched. And they will be loathsome to all mankind. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Thanks be to God. No, so what, what is going on? I told you, Isaiah is all over. He went from comfort to ye, my people, to the worms will not die, the fire will not burn. So what is going on here? Now, there's some question of whether this is, fancy word time, you ready? Whether this is eschatological or if it's referencing today. Eschatological is simply a reference to the end of times when Jesus comes back and sets things right. Excuse me, I still do have a little cough. <coughs> <coughs> there it is. Um, so, so the question of whether this is about end times or whether it applies to now. And that's going to be a theme throughout Third Isaiah. But if we look at the context of what's going on here, the people have returned from exile. God made all these promises. You're going to go back to the promised land, going back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, back to where the temple was, back where the, the Ark of the Covenant has been stored. All these things will be restored to you. And they get back and they're like, what is this? Like everything is just in ruins. The temple has been destroyed. All the precious jewels and metals have been stripped from the temple. These places that they've heard about over and over from their parents and their grandparents, their fathers and their fathers' fathers have told stories about this wonderful place. And now 70 years have gone by, they've returned and things are just falling apart. The homes that their parents once knew are no longer there everything has been wiped out. And the people, they're they're just looking around and they're like, this, this is not what we were promised. And the scripture tells us several reasons for why that is. But you know, when you look at the stories here in Isaiah, there's several things that we could think of. Like, why would God promise this one thing and then this thing happened? One, did God lie to the people? Or was God wrong? Well, I don't, I don't actually like either of those options. <laughs> Hopefully you have some problem with that too, right? 
God's not going to lie? Is God wrong? Well, maybe there's something more going on here. What we see in, as we read through Tritero or Third Isaiah is the people come back and there's a lot of corruption. The powerful are trying to make more money off of a bad situation. The people are abusing their powers, abusing their rights. They're not following the commands of God. They're going about their own way. It's like they've never even learned anything in all of the time in exile. So the people return and they just say, this wasn't what we were promised. I feel like I can relate to that. Because here we are, it's January 30th, is that right? Here we are, <laughs> it's January 275th, it feels like, right? This has been the longest January in my life. <laughs> I'm glad you think it's funny. <laughs> no, so in all reality, like one year ago, we were lining up, like signing online, like trying to get these vaccinations. Vaccinations were finally out. Um, I was one of the first, as soon as I was able to get my vaccination, I got my vaccination. And we were promised that, you know, after a while, we would be able to meet again in person and without masks among other people. Like, you could see people face to face and not have to worry about passing anything on. We were promised, I and mean, we were told it was okay this past summer to gather together. And, and then something shifted. Something changed. Were we lied to? Were people corrupt? I don't know. Maybe somebody was just wrong. Maybe things just change. Maybe viruses mutate. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. But all I know is when I look around today, this is not what I was promised. As many of you know, I, probably all of you know because I told you by email, <laughs> we had COVID in our house last couple of weeks ago. It went through our family. I'm not sure exactly who all had it and who didn't. Um, but it did land one of us in the emergency room. We spent six hours in the ER, a fully vaccinated person. And I'm not blaming anybody for this. I'm not pointing fingers and saying I was lied to. I'm not blaming anyone for corruption. I, I fully believe that things change, that things pivot, that things mutate. And sometimes it just stuff happens. But what I'm trying to say this morning, again, not blaming anyone, all I want to say is, this is not what we were promised. So I kind of feel like I have an understanding, and I don't want to put myself in the shoes or sandals of the Israelites as they return to the promised land, but I get the feeling that I kind of have a sense of what they're going through. These promises, these declarations were made, and this just isn't it. So in the middle of all this brokenness, in the middle of this pain that they're feeling, there's this amazing thing that happens in Isaiah chapter 62. God speaks up. And in the middle of this, as the people are feeling broken, as they feel like they're, they're just desolate, God says to them, I'm not going to keep silent. I will not remain quiet. Like, <laughs> amen, I, I'd love to hear that. I, I'm just going to read that again. I wasn't going to, but I, I will now. Um, the first couple of verses are just so powerful. God says to Isaiah, to speak to the people, he says, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all kings your glory. It's not just like God's going to call out just to the Israelites. He's going to pronounce it to all the world. And even the kings of the other nations, they're going to take notice that God is active, God is alive, God is doing something among the people. And one of the things that God has said that he will do, he says, I will give you a new name. And like all that build up, and it's like, I'm going to give you a new name. <laughs> like, I've got a name. Like, I'm, I'm Kevin. And if I didn't like that, I've got a middle name. Maybe you didn't know it. My middle name is Matthew. Like, if you don't like one name, you can go by the other. God says he's going to give you a new name. But here's the thing about names. When we are given names, they have meaning. They have purpose. So for instance, um, those of you that have children, um, just looking around. Okay, everybody that's here that is over the age of 18 has a, ch a child. So you probably had some of these experiences yourself. Um, when our children were born, actually before they were born, we started planning. 
we decided we wanted to go with certain names, and these names have meaning to us. Perhaps your children's names are, are family names, or perhaps they have some sort of, how many artists do you have, Gary? Well, oh, that's true. You, you, <laughs> right, but so there's no meaning behind that. Um, you look into the meaning of your children's names. A firstborn child is Paxton Christopher. Pax means peace in Latin. Christopher means Christ bearer. So when we named our child Paxton Christopher, our hope was that he would be a peaceful bearer of Christ. Now, if you go out on any kid's athletic field, like on the pitch for soccer, or you go on the basketball court, um, <laughs> you, you have a name too. <laughs> but it's not all about you. His name was easier to work with. <laughs> if you go out on any kid's athletic field, go out on flag football, whatever you might be on, um, you will always hear certain names out there. Maybe names that aren't that common. But these names say something about what the parents hope for the child. Okay, you go out on a, a kid's soccer field, you're always going to find a gunner. You, you will find gunner, you will find Brock. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but I'll say it anyways. In, in Stanton City local schools, we even have a legend. And that kid is like, his parents named him well. His kid is extremely athletic. Like, he puts us all... But these names, they say something about who their parents hope that they'll be. You go into the reading circle at the library, you'll find parents have named their kids after literary characters. You'll find Holden's. You'll find Hermione's. I even find a few Katniss. I don't know. Literary figures, if you don't got it. All right. <laughs> But you can see these, these names, they have meanings. We, we have purpose behind the names we give to our children. And your parents probably named you for a reason as well. But as I said, <laughs> we often acquire other names as we go on. People tell us different stories. They provide different narratives than the ones that our parents intended for us. So maybe that was really good. Maybe you had a nickname in high school that spoke to your athleticism or your quirkiness or your, your, I don't even know, Gary's back there shaking his head, I'm afraid to ask, so I won't. <laughs> Is it appropriate? <laughs> well, my, my, my aunt, my KD handle was Jenna. All right. <laughs> Started out, you know, Jar, with a friend of ours that worked at Edwards, uh, but that wasn't good enough, and probably knew it, so. Well, see, there's, there's, but well, people give us these names, and, and sometimes they're really good, but sometimes they're hurtful. And sometimes we buy into that as well. And I mentioned some of these names, these identities that we take upon ourselves. Sometimes it's things like, like fat or lazy. Sometimes it's, it's worthless or dumb. We acquire these nicknames. I'll come back to you. Acquire these nicknames, acquire these feelings, acquire these alternate egos, identities, and we begin to identify as such. We see ourselves as broken, this is who we are. But you see, God has this history of giving us new names. Think about the people in the Bible. Think about stories in the Old and New Testament. We have stories like Abram, who God changed his name to, Abraham. We have guys like Saul. Saul was given the name Paul. Jacob was given a new name. Jacob was called Israel. And even Jesus, he decides that he's going to change a few names along the way as well. He's got this guy, his, his disciple, his name is Simon. And Jesus looks at Simon, he says, you know, Simon, I don't see you as a Simon. <laughs> like, we can do better. Peter. To Simon, he gave the name Peter. And we find this in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus says, and I, will and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. God comes in, Jesus comes in, and all these names that he's been given, all these identities that Peter's been assigned, Simon's been assigned, Jesus says, no, 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 now you'll be known as my rock. Upon you, I'm going to build my church. So we find this in this passage from, from Isaiah 62. Um, it starts out, no longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. Like, I'm going to guess that nobody just came up to you like, and called you desolate, right? <laughs> Hey, yo, Israel, you're deserted. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if this was like a real literal nickname for them. I'm going to guess not. But again, we're not just talking about literal nicknames. 
We're talking about identities their self-image as well. How did they see themselves? They evidently saw themselves as deserted, as desolate, as broken. And God comes in and says, no longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called, you ready for this one? Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you, and the land will be married. We haven't done, well, we haven't met for weeks, so <laughs> let's do that. Let's everybody say Hep. Hefzibah, together, Hefzibah. Um, and the reason that these are kind of like this, let me show you. Hefzibah literally means my delight is in her, and Beulah means married. And the reason that the, actually I think most translations leave this untranslated is because otherwise it would just be repetitive. This is Hebrew poetry. It would read, um, no longer will you be called deserted or named desolate, but you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. <laughs> so for poetic reasons, they leave it untranslated. Hephzibah, my delight is in her. Beulah, meaning married. So the thing is now, this identity that these people have, that Israel has, no longer will they be known as broken and desolate and despair. They will be known as God's spouse, married to God. They will be known as the one in whom God finds delight. And they will be one. Whenever somebody thinks of Israel, they're going to think of God. When someone thinks of God, they'll think of Israel. And you know I love to do this. I like to make these mashups of the celebrity names sometimes. You, know, you have got the Brangelinas and all those. I know they're no longer together, but I like that one. I thought it was going to work. God and Israel, they mash up and they become Grisrael. The idea is, you think of Israel, you're thinking of God. You're thinking of God, you're thinking of Israel. You cannot separate these two. Now they become Grisrael. And I know I had to insert an R, but it works. <laughs> and the thing is about this marriage, you know, sometimes in the Bible we find stories like marriages, they're not necessarily what you would call good. <laughs> sometimes there's like mistakes that go on, and, and you see like um, somebody feeling kind of like they hadn't gotten into that relationship. Um, for instance, there's a story in the Old Testament about Jacob who decides he's going to marry somebody and goes through the whole ceremony and wakes up the next morning and he's married to the wrong sister. No judgment, it happens, right? <laughs> he marries Leah instead of Rebecca, the one he wanted. <laughs> and I say that because Cadrian has a Leah sister. So. <laughs> I'm not making no judgment here. No. <laughs> Um, but, but God doesn't have like this marriage remorse. It's not like there was a bait and switch. He, he married the wrong one and woke up the next morning to realize his mistake. God is actually excited to be married to Israel. Like, it's a good thing. He's celebrating this marriage. It says in verse 5, as a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. God is excited about this relationship that he is establishing with the people of Israel. And it's not even just an establishment. They've had a relationship. It's a renewal of a relationship. And my friends, this is good news, not only for Israel, it's good news for us as well. Because we know that this language of marrying to God um, isn't just found in the Old Testament. It's found in the New Testament as well. Multiple times in the New Testament, we find things like this. In Revelation 19, 7, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The lamb here is a reference to Jesus himself. And who is the bride of, of the lamb? That is the church. So just as God is saying in Isaiah 62, I choose you. I want to be married to you. I'm going to celebrate this event. In the New Testament, we are told time and time again that Christ wants to marry us. And I know that this is a weird metaphor for us because, you know, I'm like, already married. Like, I already have a name. I'm already married. Like, so over two here, God. It's a metaphor. And I know it's kind of weird, but yet there's reason behind it. So let's explore that just a little bit more here. Why does God marry us? Why does Christ call us his bride? So that brings us to this part of the scripture that I said was kind of familiar to many of us, but maybe not completely clear. And that's the language of Beulah land. Are you familiar with, have you ever heard that phrase before? Raise your hand if you've heard Beulah land. Some of you have heard it. Some of you are like, 
No. <laughs> you heard it this morning when I was playing a song. Well, that's probably where most people know it from, is from the song. Actually, there's a couple songs. There's Beulah Land and there's Sweet Beulah Land. Other people will know this uh, phrase, Beulah Land, from Ray Fien. There's a, <laughs> right, right, there is a retirement home down there called Beulah Land. And we're going to push that out a little bit because that's, that's kind of weird when you start thinking about it. Um, no offense to anybody that has any connection to Beulah Land. Um, but what we do is we find this in a number of places in literature and in song. Now, I should back up a little bit and say Isaiah 62 is the only place in the Bible where we find the phrase Beulah Land. And not only is it the only place in the Bible, it's the only place in all of ancient literature that we find this. So we don't have a lot to go on. But one place that we do find the phrase Beulah Land in more modern literature is in Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Anybody ever, ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Kind of, yeah. It's like, I've heard of it. I'm familiar with it. Um, it's a fictional story about a person passing over, I think, into eventually heaven. If I'm wrong, sounds like people don't know <laughs> what his role is. But Bunyan talks about this place called Beulah Land, and he gets it directly from Isaiah 62. And he talks about this place, Beulah Land, being just past the shadow of death, just beyond the great despair. And that every bird in the world is known to be there. It's singing its song in this place called Beulah Land. And every flower on the earth is bursting forth and showing its colors there in this place. In Beulah Land, there is no want for drink, or for food. Everything is available in full abundance. But in Bunyan's depiction of Beulah Land, it is not quite heaven. He says it is near the city of pearls and precious stones. It's just across the river from the final destination. So when I talk about Beulah Land as a retirement home, I'm not sure if they're like saying you've got one foot in and one foot out, <laughs> or if they actually think of that place as heaven itself. I'm going to guess neither one of them actually translates well. <laughs> So this is John Bunyan's understanding of Beulah Land. This is this place that's almost there, but not quite. What many people probably know is the song Sweet Beulah Land by Squire Parsons. Here's some lyrics from that song. Parsons writes, Just across the river, where my faith shall end in sight, there's just a few more days to labor, then I will take my heavenly flight. So for Parsons, Beulah Land is heaven. So when I look at these two options, like is it, is it fully heaven? Is it like next to heaven? Is it heaven adjacent? Is it kind of parallel to heaven? Uh, I kind of actually like that ambiguity. Because if we trans go back all the way to, to third Isaiah, understanding the context of third Isaiah, we read these passages that I was asking earlier. It's like, is that, is that eschatological? Or is that to be applied today? Is that for the here and now or the yet to come? So there's this ambiguity, this wrestling, this Beulah land. When God says, I will give you a new name, you will be called my, <laughs> my precious. <laughs> like Lord of the Rings. You will be my precious. You will be my spouse. So there's a lot of ambiguity there, but what I really like, and you know how I do, is we get a little bit nerdy. That was your chance to woohoo, but I know some people are, are not here today. I'm going to take another drink. I'm not even going to look up. We're going to get a... <clears throat> We're going to get a little nerdy. You know, I know you tried. We're going to get a little nerdy. We're going to close real quick, I hope. With Luther's atonement theory. For the, two, for the people that are watching at home right now, I was heard as saying we're going to get a little dirty here. So... <laughs> Anyway, I, I have this kind of love and not really love relationship with Luther. Um, Luther was very important to the Protestant movement. A lot of stuff he said was kind of funny if you look at it as a joke, but he didn't mean it as a joke. <laughs> um, but one of the things I've learned to really appreciate is actually Luther's atonement theory. And atonement theory is simply ideas of how Jesus saves us, like how his life, death, and resurrection frees us from our sins, frees us from our, our, our suffering, and um, allows us to enter into eternity with God. So Luther's atonement theory, I hadn't even heard of this until a couple of weeks ago, and perhaps it's because it's not really developed, it's underdeveloped, it's just kind of some thoughts that he kind of scribbled down on some paper, um, didn't take the time to kind of flesh it all out. 
But Luther's atonement theory is based on this idea of being married to Christ. He uses that metaphor. And what do we know about metaphors? Metaphors always break down eventually, right? So, so don't think too much about this. But, um, you know, what Luther says is that in a marriage relationship, what belongs to one person belongs to the other person as well. So where it breaks down, and I see some people looking at each other, where it breaks down is we don't share everything. You know, Sonia and I have our own toothbrushes. I don't share clothes. There are some limitations to, to this metaphor. But essentially, I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, lawyers, in a marriage relationship, if you don't have a prenuptial agreement, things are split right down the middle, right? You own them 50-50 according to the law. We'll work with that? Sure. <laughs> Luther was trained as a lawyer. So what Luther's atonement theory says is that in the marriage of the church to Christ, we acquire things from him and he takes things from us. We acquire his righteousness and he takes away our sins. So here's a few things that we can learn from Luther's theory of atonement. Though we are sinners, we take on Jesus's righteousness. Though we are subject to death, we take on his eternal life. Though we are separated from God, we become reunited with the divine. And though we are orphaned, we become children of God. So here's the concept that we find not only here in this passage from Isaiah 62, but time and time again throughout the New Testament, that we as the church are the bride of Christ, that we are married to him, that we acquire from him his righteousness, his inheritance, his status. All of those things are given to us as we send to him all the negative things, the bad things, our fallenness, our sinfulness. And even in that transaction, we send to him our identities. Not the good stuff, but all the bad stuff. Those identities, those names that we've acquired over the years, whether we've acquired them from ourselves or from other people, names like desolate and despair, names like deserted and stupid and lazy and, and broken and dumb and ugly and fat, all of those things are given to Christ. And we are given a new identity. We are called Hephzibah and Beulah. You are God's delight. You are Christ's bride, and in him you have entered Beulah land. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, today we thank you for this new identity that we've been given to, in you. We are in this stage of Beulah land, somewhere in between heaven and earth, one foot in both worlds. And Lord, we still have this identity that we take and keep upon ourselves, these, these ideas that we are less than perfect, less than ideal, less than loved. But today we give that all up to you. You have called us your delight. You have called us your spouse. So may we acquire and achieve and keep that new identity, understanding ourselves as your beloved. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, well, you may have guessed that the song that I've chosen for today is Sweet